So today we're going to have our last prayer. There are many prayers in the Bible, but these are the five so that prayers that we've chosen for this series. So we're going to be in Ephesians 1 today, and we're going to look at this, this um, prayer that Paul prayed for these people that he loved dearly. It was a church that he planted in Ephesus. Ephesus was a city in modern-day Turkey. It was a church that he had planted. Not only had he planted it, but he had lived with them for over two years. So this was a church that had become very familiar. This was a, a home church for him. These were people he knew. He knew their families. He knew their kids. He knew what their jobs were. He had enmeshed, their, he had lived his life with these people for many years. So these people were very dear for him. And his prayer for them is a very passionate prayer. And it's a very... Um, prayer that should stir us to some motivate us to some some action but before we do i want to ask you a question perhaps you have found this but have you ever been faced with having to do something that you felt completely unqualified to do and if you're breathing you say yes right maybe you got married or maybe you you had a baby or maybe you started a new job or a new school or lived in a new city and you're finding yourself or you have found yourself on, on occasions where you just feel completely unqualified. I remember when we brought home our first child from the hospital. They, uh, children, just, to, just so you know, they don't come with instruction manuals. They don't, they don't give you on your way home they make sure you have a car seat in your car. But other than that, you are on your own. You are left to figure it out. And I remember about the third day, we had our, our little daughter, Becca, at home. And I was in tears because I felt like I was the worst mom ever by day three. I was just, I didn't know what to do. She wasn't eating the way that I had wanted. I thought she should be eating. And we were on that parent, new parent hotline trying to figure out what to do. We felt completely unqualified to be parents. And it's a continual learning journey for us as parents. But maybe college students, I don't know about you, but every first week of every semester in college, I'd be looking at the syllabus in every class feeling completely unqualified. How am I ever going to survive this, this semester? How am I ever going to make it through when I'd look at all that I was supposed to be reading and the papers I was supposed to be writing? I felt completely unqualified. The good news for us is that in the scriptures, God often, in fact, most of the time, uses people who felt they were completely unqualified. And not only does he use them, he uses them to accomplish some pretty great things, some pretty significant things. In fact, he uses them to plant his first churches and to, to share his gospel in this area that that had just seen something radical happen. He uses these unqualified people who felt that they were maybe inadequate and not, not prepa adequately prepared, but he uses them to make an impact in an entire region that has changed our lives still today, 2,000 years later. So let's look at this prayer in Ephesians 1. And Paul is writing this, and it's his hope for these people, but it's our hope for you too. So as you read it, I hope you would read this as our prayer, as Grace Honolulu's prayer for you in sitting here with us today. In verse 15, <coughs> he says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. 
Wow, that is a mouthful. And the interesting thing, see, I was a journalism major in college. That is one sentence in the original Greek. That is like a wordy, long sentence that every college professor would have put a lot of red ink on. But he writes this sentence, and he's going on and on because he's trying to get them to grasp how awesome the power of God is. And not only is it awesome and powerful, but he's put that power in us, and he wants us to use it with, to make a difference in, the, in whatever area he's placed us in. And that's what we're going to talk about today because he's really trying to enlarge their perspective and give them a greater insight as to really what he's called and put them on earth to do. This scripture also happens to be the foundational scripture for our growth track. And we have a new round of our growth track starting today at our 1045 service. And Pastor Greg will be there to kick that off. But let's, I'm going to give you a general overview as we go through and unpack this scripture a little bit, a little bit deeper. So let's start in verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So Paul is praying for them. He's giving thanks for them. And he's saying, because you're loving God's people well, but not just the people in here, but you're loving all of God's people, and you're loving them well. So he's saying, you're doing a good job, and I'm asking God to give you more of even what you're doing. I'm, I want you to see God move in an even greater way. So Paul's thanking them and asking them, and then he goes on in verse 17, and this is where we get the so that prayer. So they keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. So God wants to give us this spirit, this revelation, so that we could know him. And that is step one of our growth track. And that is our prayer for you. And if you're here today, we want you to know God. Our hope and our prayer is that you would come into a relationship with the God who created you and loves you. That is our prayer. And then Paul continues on in, in this same verse. And the New Living Translation says that you may grow in your knowledge of God. See, coming into a relationship with God is just a first step. It gets us in the door, but it's not, it's not the finish line. He wants us to experience a growing relationship with God. Every day we're growing in our relationship with God. And that is what we, we say step two of our growth track, which is grow in Christ, where we, we go a little bit deeper into the mission and vision and values of our church, but we also talk about grace groups, our community. We really believe that circles, we call them circles, are better than rows, that we can, we can learn in rows, but we really, we grow in circles. We grow in a community when we are uh, be, when we have a community of people around us, it's a both and, it's not an either or. We, we need that community to shape us, to grow us. And that is what Paul is praying. I want you to, to grow in your knowledge of Christ, that you wouldn't just know God, but that you would know him better. And it would be this active pursuit of knowing and growing this, with this God who loves you and created you. And then it doesn't even stop there. He continues on. In verse 18, and he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that, and some translations say so that, so he's got two in this, in this scripture, but in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you. Most people cannot say that with confidence, that they know the hope to which he's called them, that they know why God created them, that they know the unique gift and, and purpose that God has placed in their heart. And that is our prayer for you, is that you would discover purpose. And that's why we have step three of our growth track, is discover purpose, where you would understand how God has uniquely created you. He uniquely put gifts in you, talents in you, interests in you, and that no one else is like you. You are completely unique. God created you, and he wants to, so he prays that their eyes would be enlightened, and that word enlightened is, is a big word, but it really means to, to make see, to illuminate, to, to dispel false information and be free from ignorance. So we have to learn what it is that God has put inside of us. What is that unique, that unique thing that God has put inside of you? That is discovering your purpose. 
but it's not just so that you know it because he wants you to then use it. He wants you to begin to, to put all that he's placed inside of you to make a difference, to take a step to make a difference. That is, and that's when he goes on in verse 19. And this is when he gets really excited because he starts throwing in a lot of nouns and adjectives. But he says that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. The power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that he places in you as a Christ follower. That's amazing. That is amazing. That power he exerted from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, the fullness, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So God wants to use what he's put inside of you to make a difference. You were created to make a difference. He created you to make an impact. He put some gifts inside of you, some talents inside of you, so that you could be used by God to make a difference. And really what you do makes it, can make an eternal difference. We, we want to be available to meet physical needs for people, but there are spiritual needs that this broken world has that God wants you to help be an answer for. He, he has people in your workplace, people in your classes, people in your, on your campus and in your community and in your family that he has placed around you for you to make an eternal difference so that you can see them take that step and, and know the God that created them, see them reconciled to God. So what you do can make an eternal difference. David Brainerd was a missionary in the early 1700s, and I, lo I, love, I loved learning a little bit about him. And, and he was, the interesting thing is that he made this incredible impact in the Native American community. So many people come to Christ in the Native American community because of his just determination to make a difference. In his prayer, he prayed something like this. This is a quote of his, Lord, help me make a difference that is utterly disproportionate to who I am. I love that. I want that to be said about me. I want, I want, when I look back at the end of my life, I want to be able to say, God, you, because of you, because of the power inside of you it, that you put inside of me, I want to have made a difference that is utterly disproportionate to who I am. And the interesting thing about him is he died at the age of 29, but God used him to make an incredible impact in a Native com American community that, that transformed a community because he said he was available. He said, God, use me to make a difference that is just disproportionate to who I am because of your power working through me. So you may go, okay, how can I, make, how can I do this? You know, where can I make a difference? The first area I'm going to just direct you to do that is to the people around you, people closest to you. People closest to you. God has placed people in your life to make a difference, for you to share, for you to touch, for you to give a word of hope, a word of encouragement, a word of direction. He has placed people in your life for the purpose of you being able to help make a difference in their life. So with those closest to you, a few weeks ago, Pastor Greg talked about being active in sharing our faith with others. And I, I hope that as we've been praying that, we've been made, I know I've been made more aware of the opportunities around me, that some I've missed, some I haven't. Some I've been able to, to take a step and make an invitation. Some I've, I've started conversations with people listened, heard their story, and been able to share my story. I hope that as we continue to pray, God, may help us to make a difference with the people that you've placed in our life, right. that, that you would see the opportunities all around you. A practical way is just inviting someone to coffee, offering to pray, pray for someone. Another thing you can do is invite them to church. Right. Invite them to church. You know, you may have seen these um, cards on your seats when you came in this morning. 
next week we have a series starting that, that everybody can understand and relate to. It's called Relational Vampires. Learning to love the people that suck the life out of you. <laughs> we, all, y we all have these people in our lives, right? Your coworker has people that they're struggling to learn to love. And they, they may not go to church, they may not understand the Bible, but they can say, oh, I have a critical coworker, an over-controlling family member, or an overly needy neighbor. I need to learn to love the people that suck the life out of me. Pastor Greg is going to start next week on a four-week series on learning to love these relational vampires in our lives. It's going to be a great opportunity for us to invite someone. We invited two people yesterday when we were at the drive through at, at McDonald's. Just there, People are interested. They want to know. Everybody has relational conflict. This is a great opportunity for us to take a step and say, hey, you mentioned you are struggling with, with that, that coworker in your relationship with them. This may help. This may help. And just invite them to come along. So that's a great opportunity next week. Extend an invitation. And many of you are here today because someone extended an invitation to you. And think of the difference it has made in your life because they did. You're, you will be so fulfilled when you have a guest. There will be something inside of you that will change when you have a guest come and see them, see God work in their life. It is, it is an amazing thing. So I encourage you next week, invite a neighbor for relational vampires. Another way you can make a difference is in our church. I'm just going to dispel a couple myths right off the bat. Um, this is, oftentimes people will say, um, they'll say, uh, th this, they're surprised at what this uh, cafeteria looks like. So the myth is that this looks like this all the time. That not true. This is, a high, this is an elementary school cafeteria. We have people that give of their time on Saturday night that come and help set up. We have families that come with their kids on Saturday night to set up our children's ministry. We have people who come and love on people in the parking lot and make sure that our guests can find a place to park. We have people that come and, and are just here to greet and love people at the front door when people come and say hi so they make sure someone is greeted. There, there are a lot of opportunities that, to make a difference. This, we create an environment together as we serve. The second myth people often say is it doesn't look like you need any help. Well, that is not true because we can accomplish so much more with more people. With more, with more people, we can do more. We can reach more people. We can share with more people. We can love on more people. So I encourage you to look for opportunities to make a difference, even in our church. Maybe you're thinking, I can come a little early and greet or help in the parking lot. Or maybe I can come one Saturday night a month and help for 30 minutes and set up our children's ministry. Maybe you're thinking, oh man, I think I can sing. Well, we'll, we'll let Pastor Randy decide that, but we'll introduce you to him. <laughs> the third way is in our community. You can help in our community. Uh, this last summer, at the beginning of summer, we gave, many, we gave you an opportunity to, to participate in some uh, service projects in our community. And many of you came out and participated. We served with Meals on Wheels. We packed over 9,000 meals for Kapuna that have, uh, are, were looking for you know, just needing meals to eat. And then we also built a home for a family in Waimanalo. Well, we helped build a home. We didn't build the whole home. I think maybe we... Might have put up a few walls, but we helped build a home for a family in Waimanalo. This woman had been waiting 40 years and just got her application uh, approved from Hawaiian Homelands. So we worked with Habitat for Humanity and helped build a home one day last week. So these were opportunities for you to say, I see a need in my community. I want to be a part. Thank you, God, for, for allowing me to, to be a part of blessing my community. And we'll have other opportunities as, as the, the months go on, but but you don't have to wait for us. You can rally your grace group and say, you know what, there's a, a, a woman in our neighborhood that, that is a single elderly woman that needs her yard cut. Let's do that as a, as a grace group. You can make a difference where you're at, right. doing just little things and looking for, for needs and saying, I'm gonna take a step to, be that to fill that need in my community. So in your sphere of, in your, commu in your 
with those people closest to you in our church and also in, our com in your community. You can make a difference. You may go, okay, how? Well, give me some practical ways to make a difference. First way is pray. You can pray. We can all pray, right? And when we came in this morning, you were given this prayer guide. It's our 40 days of breakthrough prayer, and it's starting this, starting this Tuesday. We are going to take these five prayers. We, we realize we, we've done one a week, and they've been so powerful that we, we really want these prayers to become a lifestyle prayer for you. I, I know for me, as I, as I drive now, these are five prayers that I know I can pray. I can pray to be strengthened with power. I can pray to be active in sharing my faith. I can pray for unity. I can pray for discernment. And I can pray to be used by God to make a difference. I can just, right now, five focused, powerful prayers. I want to encourage you to pray with us over these next 40 days. And let's trust that God will build a culture of powerful, focused prayer in our church and that as we pray for these things the opportunities would begin to pop up and not that they would just pop up but we would begin to be aware of the opportunities when they pop up and we would see the needs as they're surrounding us so we have a prayer guide for you we encourage you to to, to pray with us if your kids are in children's ministry our children's ministry director put together a wonderful guide for your kids with every day so i'm going to go back there and get one because it's just that good you can pray. Your family can pray. Teach your kids to pray. Let's pray. We also have a prayer wall in the back. You may have seen it when you came, came in. That is a visual for us to stand together as a community. Nobody's going to read the prayers, but we want to stand with you in your prayers. And what big prayers. We want to pray big prayers, faith-filled prayers that just trust God for big things. We, want it. we don't want safe living and small thinking. We want big, faith-filled prayers. So we're going to put our prayers on the prayer wall. There's a, another color. There's a blue for answered prayers. So we want to celebrate, too, when God answers prayers. You know, some of you may be thinking, oh, man, not everybody in my grace group is here today, or, or I have a, a coworker who may be really interested in this. On our app, we have this linked in the events. So if you download our app, look at the events section, and you can text the whole thing to your friends, family, people that aren't here today. So I encourage you to do that on our app. So those are just practical, that's one practical way that we can pray. We can ask God to use us in a powerful way to break through some of the barriers that maybe are hindering our loved ones from coming to Christ or maybe hindering us from really see hearing God's voice clearly. We can ask God to use us to pray these five prayers eight times for 40 days. So that is one way. Another thing we can do is you can give. God has given you resources. He has blessed you to be a blessing. That's why we do take an offering. At, at, we receive an offering at the end of every service because it is our way of saying, God, thank you for using me. Thank you for blessing me. This is one way I want to give back to you in response to who you are and what you have done. And in Luke 6, he says it, uh, Jesus says it this way, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together, make room for more, running over, poured into your lap. So when we give, it's not just this little meager thing that God gives us back. He, he says it, it is running over. The amount you give will determine the amount you give back. And a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a woman in our church, and, and she works in a medical clinic in uh, Chinatown. And she said they are, they are limited on resources, especially with what some of the needs are for the people that, that come in, the homeless that come in off the streets. And she gave me a list of things. And I said, you know what? I will just say, if you want to give, bring, pick up one of these items and bring them next Sunday. In the next couple Sundays, we'll have a box in the back. And we can help meet the needs of this medical clinic in Chinatown. They're, they need slippers, socks, band-aids, T-shirts, shorts. They've got... Um, people that come in for medical issues off the streets and they're looking for just socks for their feet. They're looking for slippers. They need shoes. They need just little things. And, and she said she would take them to, uh, to the clinic so that they can just help have more on hand when, when they come. So that's another practical way that you can just take a step to give. So pray. We're going to give. And then the third one is we're going to go. We're going to go. 
And that doesn't mean that you have to go overseas to Africa or Europe. You can go right here. You can go to the cubicle next to you. You can go across the street. You can go and serve here. You can, you can say, God, I want to come 15 minutes early and be a smiling face for a, a broken person that comes in the door. I want to help with children's ministry check-in because just families just getting here in the morning with, with two shoes on your kid's feet is a victory. And you can be that greedy, that smiling face that just helps them feel like they can just take a deep breath and come and sit in service and hear a message from a, from a weekend that maybe was, was stressful. Right. You can help in the parking so that a, n- a new person would, would come and be not be directionless in where to go and wh- what to do to navigate a, a brand new church for the very first time. You can give, you can go. Uh, one of the just practical ways, this isn't going to sign you up for anything, but it will let us know that you're interested. And you can text serve to this number. And then we'll just ask for your email, your phone number, and maybe what area you're interested in, in serving. And you can just take a step, but it's not going to commit you to anything. It's just saying, I'm interested. I want to make a difference. I want to use what God has placed inside of me because I see, God, that you, you have called and created me to make a difference. You know, we have, a, we have a puppy, and her name is Ellie, and she's super cute. Ellie, does, Ellie doesn't think all day about her purpose in life. She doesn't look for ways to make a difference with her life. Her, her, her way of making a difference is by shredding my kids' homework, by peeing all over the house, by running in circles and digging holes in the backyard. God has created human beings differently. That is what <laughs> That is what makes us unique. We are created in the image of God. We are created in the image of God and he came to make a difference in our lives. And that is the fingerprint of God in our life is that now he wants to use us to make a difference in the lives of other people. And you can do that. You can do that with those closest to you. You can do that in our church, and you can do that in our community as we pray, as we give, and as we go together. When you came in, you did uh, receive a little ruler. You may be wondering, oh, no, it's not math class. That was my kids probably going math class. No. But you were given a ruler. I'm going to ask you to pull it out. So this is a ruler that just represents the, the years that you've been given. And I'm going to ask you to just, you know, our days are numbered, right? It is the reality that we are all here for a limited time, that we're given a limited number of days. And I'm just going to ask you to do your best guess as to when you will go be with Jesus. So I'm going to choose 95. Greg chose 100, so he's going to, he's shooting for 100. Oh, he said 105. Okinawans, you can just add an extension later. You can go to 130 if you're Okinawan. So you can just tear that piece off. Okay, then look at where you are in age. Those are the years that you've, you've already lived, and tear that off. You can't do anything about that. That is the past. It is done. So what you're left with, th- this is, this is, these are the days you're left with. And, and I'm, you know, I'm going to go home and put, just to highlight the the portion that I have left with kids in my home. This is a visual reminder. I don't know if you're visual, but but I like to have visual reminders that my time is limited. My time is limited. My days are numbered. And God, I don't want to waste a day. I don't want to waste a day. I want to be used by you to make a difference with every day. I don't want to look back on my life and go, man, I could have done more, should have done more, could have reached that person, should have shared that with that person. I want to look back and go, God, the the years that you gave me, I lived them well, I enjoyed them well, I loved well, but I I allowed you to use me in a way that is utterly disproportionate to who I am. So that is my prayer for you, that God would you that you would know God, and that you would grow continually in your relationship with Christ, 
and that you would discover the purpose for which he's created you. But then you would look at all of that and go, God, help me to, to use these days to make a difference. Make a difference with those that are closest to me. Make a difference in this church. Make a difference in my community. And I'm going to trust that you're going to give me those opportunities as I pray, as I give, and as I go.